This is one of a three-part series as a build-up to the very last Racism and Reconciliation, part three. This study is titled The Creation Story. And as I encourage at all times, as you go through this study, please observe, analyze, and research everything you see in this study. Nature. It has this very interesting way of soothing a broken spirit. It has this sort of hypnotic effect over the human psyche that helps our minds to distress. There is something about the vibratory sound of an insect, the birds singing early in the morning, the sound of the gushing waters pouring over the rocks, the stillness of the trees in the depth of the forest, and the soft blowing of the wind with the speed of the currents. In the air that is invisible to the naked eye of man, and its varying noise decibels can temporarily change the temperature and sometimes the shade or tones on our faces when we least expect it and soothing sounds can create a deep peace. We've all been created with a built-in deep-rooted curiosity to learn, to explore, to experiment, to ask questions and to ponder on the things that intrigues us. A curiosity that is activated from very young. Many questions will never be answered. Some mysteries will never be unlocked. Our finite minds are still not ready to grasp even simple truths. And corporate and academic structures try to limit that hunger for learning for fear of losing total control over the minds of men. But man's curiosity and his desire to learn never stops people for every single day is school. In our very busy and sometimes everyday hectic lives, we very rarely stop and think and are unaware on how much we depend upon nature and the different mechanisms that have been put into place that help to keep all life on earth to function like clockwork. Nearly every single creature on this earth totally depends upon that colorless, odorless and tasteless fluid that can form into solids, liquids or gas. It is water. It is a compound that is formed by the union of two different kinds of air, oxygen and hydrogen, and without it most life on earth would not last very long. Whether it be the vegetation we depend upon for both our food and our oxygen, or all of the different species of creatures in the animal kingdom no matter what size, or mankind where 50 to 75% of his body is made up of it, for it is vitally essential as a life force when we drink, cry, digest our food, go to the toilet, or even sweat. Before any human beings were around to be eyewitnesses to record the development of Earth's embryonic beginnings, water was divided into two portions, both oceanic and atmospheric, air being separated from water, and that blue glow that surrounds the Earth consists of air, vapor, electric fluids, gases, and other matters, is one of the most powerful energetic agents in nature. It is the atmosphere. It is the atmosphere that helps us to see the clouds in the sky, feel the heat of the sun rays and the wind blowing on our faces. It helps us to hear the different medium of sounds through the ministration of the ear, so that the ear may be considered as the conveyor of the thought of mankind, as one scientist explained. And the atmosphere also helps us to discern the different smells where molecules in the air converted by receptors in our brain helps us to detect when something smells good or if something smells bad. And a specific smell can also bring back a memory and take you back into the past where you can recall a location or an event that took place that can trigger past emotions. The first thing man was appointed and instructed to do in order to develop the creativity of his mind was to become a scientist in a number of different fields. He studied meteorology, which is the science of studying the climate, the atmosphere and its environment. He was an agronomist when he was instructed in the science of the study of crop management and soil production. Dendrology, which is the science of studying wooded plants. 
phytomorphology, the study of different aspects of plant biology. A continuous science that has been handed down throughout the ages and still continues to this day with his descendants as they intricately explore how each of the vegetation works and functions. The narrator has instructed all of his friends who have children to take them out regularly in nature. For all children all over the world, if they have easy access to a green environment, should all be trained in this experimental science, for it is the best way to nurture, to develop and to expand their thinking as recent studies have confirmed. Man was also encouraged to become a zoologist, which is the science of studying different animal species, when he was given absolute authority to name every single moving being by carefully and closely observing and analysing how each one of them behaved and functioned. Through the study of aerodynamics, he would watch how they glided through the air currents in heights that man cannot reach how creatures that were made up of many different colours and designed in many different shapes could intelligently balance its own body weight onto a plant to acquire its daily food, and how a mammal with perfectly designed claws could walk up and down a very tall vertical tree, or observing how an arachnid with many eyes and many legs could walk on the floor of the terrestrial land and even leave behind its home and in no time quickly make a new one with a set of almost unbreakable silky wires. And it continues in modern day experimental zoology that exists in both the fields and in the labs. The earliest known recorded expression of early man that has still been preserved over millennia in cave art are of animals, the oldest visual documentation of zoology, where the artwork is so skillful throughout Afro-Eurasia that some of it actually looks like moving animation in an art studio. We have been led to believe that animation is a modern invention created by Western studio artists. But when a species of antelope in South Africa called the Oryx was closely analysed, its detailed design was preserved in some of the most earliest known cave art on the African continent, with a very precise and detailed depiction of its anatomy. As man surveys this vast terrain we call Earth, and closely observes the cave art, he is now humbly admitting that he has to rethink his false theories about early man. Was he a created being gifted with intellectual abilities from the very beginning, or did he evolve over time from an amoeba into a technologically advanced modern anatomical being? Let us hear from the very scientist's own words. Prehistorians who have traditionally interpreted the evolution of art as a steady progression from simple to more complex representations may have to reconsider existing theories of the origins of art, according to Scientific American. The artwork is part of a global phenomenon originally referred to as decorated caves have been found on every continent except Antarctica, according to the London Guardian. The skill of these artists, the painting is amazing, says Jean or Jean Klotz, the French archaeologist, according to the New York Times. Rock art is one of the most intimate archives of the past. The animal paintings are technically impressive, according to Smithsonian Magazine. The animal paintings are also the oldest figurative artworks, according to Nature. Some of the most remarkable art ever conceived was etched or painted on the walls of caves according to the New Yorker. An Indonesian cave painting depicting a prehistoric hunting scene pointing to an advanced artistic culture according to new research says Al Jazeera. European Paleolithic paintings are our first evidence of our true artistic genius says Haretz. Their beauty whipsaws your sense of time. These people possess minds as fully modern as ours. Some of these artists were the first animators, says National Geographic. Early cave art shows that intellectually, they were hardly any different to us today, says Forbes. This is the testimony of modern academia 
and it confirms what has been preserved in the most reliable documented record of early man when describing his early embryonic beginnings. He was clearly an intellectual creature from the beginning. Man is also an absolutely beautifully created being that is made up of different shades of brown with different distinct facial features. But we sadly live in an age where people hate each other and will even physically attack each other over these very minor differences, which is really quite silly. And these divisions are as a result of a distortion, misunderstanding, miseducation, mythologization, romanticizing, and a falsification of human history that needs to be rightly corrected to show that no race is either inferior or superior to one another, and that each one of them in different times all accomplished the same feats where he harnessed the different materials in the natural world. Question. How long have men been eating that sweet tasting liquid made from bees? According to the New York Times, early civilizations mastered honey skills shown in rock art in Africa, India and Spain, that is, throughout Afro-Eurasia. What about clothing? When men migrated from Asia Minor to repopulate the earth according to the sacred record. He left traces of his early beginnings by the river Euphrates by making the oldest preserved material that we have on record. It was thought to have been made from flax but it was actually made from oak and it has been confirmed as the oldest fabric, the oldest cloth and the oldest textile that has ever been found. In the Petrie Museum in London, England, there is on display a dress in a cabinet. It does not look that appealing on close observation, but it was made from the flax of plants. When scholars have recently examined it, it has been confirmed as the oldest known woven garment, or the oldest dress ever discovered in the world that was found in the 19th century in ancient Egypt in North Africa. In Europe, there was a man who also had very stylish clothing, according to the London Guardian. A lot of his clothing was made from sheep wool. His remains were discovered in the Austrian Alps in 1991 and he has been named Otzi and on close examination of his items, the world's first known sheepskin coat was worn by Otzi the Iceman 5,300 years ago according to the Daily Mail. So clothing was worn throughout early Afro-Eurasia. But what about metallurgy? In early Britain, men carved swords from bronze. Men also carved into bronze and silver on the Afghan-Pakistan border. And the ancient Egyptians were also skilled at carving into the metal, bronze. Petrology is the branch of geology concerned with the investigation of the composition, structure and history of the rock masses building up the accessible portions of the Earth's crust. Rocks are of three types igneous, sedimentary and metamorphic and rocks are usually defined as aggregates of minerals and from very early man harnesses hard material in nature, especially stone. In the Alpine mountain bordering Italy and France, the earliest of men carved into beautifully polished stone. In early China they skillfully carved blades and axes from different stones like jade with a mathematical precision and the Egyptians carved into the highest number of stones than any other nation. The ancient Assyrians preserved their facial features in stone. The ancient Egyptians also preserved their features in stone and the Romans skillfully preserved their facial features in stone also. What about traveling? Before man used the automobile to travel from one place to another in a more efficient space of time, Throughout most of human history, he mastered the horse in the highly sophisticated culture of Egypt and North Africa, the equestrian masters in ancient Assyria in northern Iraq and Western Asia, and the very well-trained soldiers of the vast terrain of the Roman Empire. What about the strange custom of artificial cranial deformation? This 19th century photo is of a Frenchman. You can see he has an elongated skull. In ancient Iran, they also discovered these similar shaped skulls in some of their skeletal remains. It has been preserved in the sculpture of the ancient Egyptians, 
for it was a practice among the nobility and also among the people of the South American culture of Peru and all over the world from Papua New Guinea to France, in the Congo and in North America they practice this procedure called artificial cranial deformation. What about caesarean section? For many think that this is a new procedure. The late renowned US fertility specialist Dr. Abner I. Wiseman collected a vast number of pre-Columbian artifacts and among the many artifacts discovered in Peru in South America was of a woman who had caesarean section performed on her. It was performed during medieval Europe by a Persian polymath during the Islamic Golden Age and preserved in the archives of London's Wellcome Library and Museum from Notes on Labour in Central Africa published in the Edinburgh Medical Journal, Volume 20, April 1884, is a picture from the 19th century drawn in the Kingdom of Uganda of a caesarean section. When observed by Erwin Akonecht, the Polish-born historian of medicine, he struggles to comprehend that it could be accomplished in Africa. Do you want to know why? Because even in the 21st century, ideas about the primitivism of black Africa are widely held even today, according to the Financial Times. But the man who recorded it in 1879, former English-born missionary Dr. Robert William Felkin, was so impressed that he took the instrument that was used to perform the operation from Africa into Britain that was used as evidence and he also saw them use their own anaesthetic to keep the woman calm during the operation. What about travelling and migration that includes navigation? The trade winds are the prevailing easterly winds that circle the earth near the equator that have helped ships to sail to the west from antiquity. Men have been sailing the waves from the earliest of times to this very day. It is not something that started and developed in the 16th century as modern documentation is confirming. You will only believe that if you are controlled by modern thinking. If we could just humbly step outside of our modern day approach at looking at the past and just look at the clear evidence that sit us in the face, we will be able to approach history a lot better without modern day biases. The boat carved into rock from ancient Egypt at the top, the boat carved into stone from ancient Crete in the center, and the boat carved into stone from the Indus Valley Civilization in India Pakistan at the bottom all have the same design of an upturned prow and stern, a consistent feature in nearly all archaic representations of boats. So when did navigation start? Of the origin of navigation, no satisfactory conjecture can be offered nor do we know to what nation to ascribe the merit of having conferred so important a benefit of mankind, according to the 19th century English Egyptologist Sir John Gardner Wilkinson. The art of shipbuilding took a stride, says the 19th century Scottish historian Dr. James Aitken Wiley. From earliest times man had sailed the seas, at least he had crept along the shores, but in how humble a craft. Very recently, a number of blue glass beads were discovered in a grave in the Scandinavian country of Denmark in Northern Europe. When they traced where it came from, they discovered an ancient trading route that existed in Afro-Eurasia between Scandinavia, Egypt and Mesopotamia. But this was not the only discovery that has raised eyebrows. The narrator purchased a book in 1999 titled The Mummies of Urumqi did Europeans migrate to China 4,000 years ago? Now the Han Chinese are the dominant indigenous people of China, but people who looked like Europeans with ginger or auburn hair were discovered in China dating to around 1000 BC. These are the preserved mummified remains of what they looked like and you can clearly see that they are people from the European continent from their distinct facial features and from the color of their hair. And when they closely observed the beautifully stitched and designed clothing that they wore, it was strikingly identical to the style of clothing that Celtic people wore in Northern Europe. And as shown in a previous study, a close DNA analysis confirmed that they were actually from Europe, which shows people have been traveling the globe for years. In a book titled Unexpected Faces in Ancient America, a book 
than the rate of purchase in 2016, also quoted in a previous study. The late Alexander von Wartenau, the former German ambassador to the United States and professor of Mexican art history, had a vast private collection of artifacts from Mesoamerica. This was one of the heads from Mexico in his collection. He observed that the Eiffold was designed in the exact same style as the 1000 BC Nok culture of Nigeria in West Africa. The three scars around the mouth is still prevalent in many of the different black tribes in Africa. And the design of the nose was strikingly identical to the same design of the noses of the Benin art from Nigeria in the British Museum. Quarried from solid volcanic rock are a number of enormous heads that were rediscovered from the beginning of the 19th century. They are the oldest culture in Mexico called the Olmecs and these heads range in height from 5 to 8 feet tall and their facial features are clearly black African. On close examination of these heads, like this one on display in Tenochtitlan, San Lorenzo Colossal Head 10, when you look at the side profile of this carved head with the high cheekbones, flat nose, thick lips and a plug in the ear, and look at the side profile of this woman of Ethiopia, they are strikingly identical. The same earplugs and the same facial features. The Masa of Kenya also bore their ears in this fashion. And the late British politician and Pan-Africanist John Richard Arthur said in 1918 that the celebrated anthropologist in the human species strongly intimates that Africa had its share in the peopling and the settlement of some sections of South America. So we are clearly observing that races have been traveling, migrating and settling all over the globe for hundreds and thousands of years and we shall cite one more example. The cultures of Central America with its beautifully designed temples and the cultures of India with their beautiful designed temples seem very far away from each other. But in India, they play an ancient board game called Pashisi. And the ancient Aztec culture of Central America once played the exact same game with the exact sequences of moves with the exact same pieces. Now, how did that work? In 2004, the University of Pennsylvania published a study titled Scientific Evidence for Pre-Columbus Transoceanic Voyages. This 273-page document used evidence from archaeology, historical and linguistic sources, ancient art and conventional botanical studies, where they discovered nearly 100 plant species that was present in both the Eastern and Western Hemisphere before Christopher Columbus's first voyage. We shall cite just a few of them. Southern Mexican cotton was discovered in Guinea in West Africa and a distinctly West African cotton was introduced into Mesoamerica before the arrival of Columbus. The pineapple is indigenous to Brazil, but it has been discovered on sculptures in a 5th century AD Indian temple, artifacts from ancient Egypt and Pompeii, and the 19th century British Assyriologist Sir Austin Henry Layard on the right and Sir Henry Crane Rawlinson on the left saw them carved into the artwork of 7th century BC Neo-Assyrian bas-reliefs. The seal grain called corn, also known as maize, is indigenous to Mexico in Central America. But it has been confirmed that corn was around in Afro-Eurasia centuries before Columbus. It was found growing in Burma and South Korea before the arrival of Spanish sailors. When the Portuguese sailed to West Africa, they found people eating maize another name for corn as their staple diet in Guinea. This is a documented incredible modern peer-reviewed reports. Nature in 1967 documented that corn was discovered in South Africa in the 14th century. In the National Center for Biotechnology Information in 2005, it documents how corn was recorded in China in 1368. And in Springerlink in 1989, corn was also found sculpted in temples in India in the 12th and 13th century.
AD. So man has been traveling the globe and trading with each other for thousands of years and there is no such thing as a superior race. But there are some differences and we will briefly go over them again. The facial morphology of people of black African descent varies but they usually have a very dark brown skin pigment with large and active melanosomes that produces eumelanin that provides the best intrinsic sun protection for the skin. They usually have a wider nostril width and thicker lips where the upper and lower volumes are usually the same. The facial morphology of people of white European descent varies also but they usually have a lighter shade of brown skin. They have a longer nose and more narrow nostrils and thinner lips where the top and bottom lips can vary in size. The facial morphology of people throughout the Asian continent also varies from the Near East to the Far East or from Western Asia to Southeast Asia. Some of them have very light brown skin and the further south you go, the darker the skin complexion. They also have a variation in the size of their nose and their lips, but most have black hair which is the most common colour or genetic trait of human hair globally. People of Eurasian descent have more body hair than people of black African descent and there are some striking similarities on how their hair growth develops in each of their beards but there are some differences. There are three distinct ethnic hair profiles with their own distinct characteristics. Asian hair is usually straight with a round cross section shape and this hair type has the fastest growth rate on earth. 1.4 centimeters per month but it has the lowest density. Caucasian hair can be straight, wavy or curly. Its color can vary from blonde to dark brown and it grows diagonally at a rate of about 1.2 centimeters per month. The hair strands are oval in shape with the highest density of the three ethnic categories. Black African hair type is the only hair that grows against the laws of gravity. It is generally categorized by tight curls and kinks and grows almost parallel to the scalp. This hair type has the lowest growth rate on earth that is 0.9 centimeters per month due to its spiral structure that causes it to curl upon itself during growth. The hair strand has a flattened shape and because of the way it grows unlike other races it is very rare that head lice can find a home for its claws find it difficult to hold onto the spiral shape according to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. But despite these minor differences, man is still the same species. He eats daily to survive to strengthen the body for the food provides the nutrients, energy and growth for the body. He sleeps to recharge the body to repair itself and so that it can reduce stress, improve your memory and control the nerves and he generally wants to live a simple and happy life without unnecessary conflict and drama. But like the cave art, as man closely studies the very detailed and intricate design of the human body with its many different layers of flesh and bone, he has described it as the most amazing piece of engineering on the earth and has come to the same conclusion as a shepherd who was later anointed as a head of state who penned these beautiful words of poetry when describing the structure of the human anatomy when he said, I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Let us briefly look at one of its most important features. The facial skeleton consists of 14 bones and it creates a scaffold onto which soft tissue is draped, for it supports the soft tissue of the face and the cranium forms a protective cavity for the brain. One set of bone fuses the eye sockets or orbits for the eyes to comfortably rest in to help its anatomical structure to rotate with the principle of optics. The olfactory system that helps us to breathe and smell is the bone that upholds the nose and navel cavities and there are the bones that help the oral cavities that consist of the digestive and respiratory system. Our facial skeleton structure changes from infancy to adulthood and it differs in time according to our ethnic group for aging changes the skin, muscle, 
fat and the underlying facial skeleton. And it is the face that plays an important role in social interaction and communication, signaling more than 20 different categories of emotions via the contraction or relaxation of muscles, which shows how we react or how we respond. And if you really want to know what a person is thinking, look carefully at the movements of their eyes when you're speaking to them. The face begins forming in the human embryo around 24 days via a complete cascade of molecular interactions. And modern digital technology is only verifying those words of poetry again that says, when I was made in secret and carefully wrought in the lower parts of the earth. And when a child is born, its eye color can vary. Its eye shape can be distinct as well as its skin tone and hair texture. And though fathers play a key role in the development of their child, not just via their productive organs, it is the woman who comes in all different shades of brown and from different cultural backgrounds and who was originally taken from man's rib, who plays one of the most central roles in both the moral and physical development of the child in the home. Not only does a woman carry each one of us in her womb for almost a year, we also depend upon her milk after birth that helps in the developing growth of our brains. She is not only a skilled economist that manages the home, but she is the chief nurturer for succeeding generations. And many women are totally unaware how important and vital their roles are in the development of each of the societies they live in. As we live in the digital age with easy access to information with a click of a button, in man's pursuit of searching for the mystery of life, he is getting access to some very interesting data and he is realizing that the earth that we live in today in the 21st century is vastly different from the earth that existed thousands of years ago. And over time, species have not been evolving, but they are either shrinking and more of them are becoming extinct and cannot be replaced. And though man has mastered the dynamics and the quarrying of rock, studied the vast sea lanes of the ocean, closely analyzed the medical properties of plants, he still asks this same question. Who are we and why are we here? When a lost custom that was put into place at the beginning of time for man to never forget his place and who he is gives us the answer. Now what is it? The Shabbat, better known as the Sabbath, is a memorial of the creation story. It was instituted at the very beginning of this earth's history by God for man to acknowledge that God is the creator of all things that we touch, smell, hear and see. So that when mortal man looks up into the heavens, either through a telescope or via the naked eye, and he sees the mathematical works of the vast innumerable celestial bodies, he would give true homage, adoration and honor to the one who put them in place and also the things he sees on the earth in nature, such as the beautiful design of the vegetation, the perfectly placed rock formation and the water that flows through it, the beautiful design of the different colors and shapes of birds and the intricate design of different insects like the boll weevil, a species of beetle, and how detailed the design of the canine, the dog, is as you magnify its face up close. But the best designed being on this earth is man, who was the very last thing to be created on this earth from the dust. And if we really and honestly believe that each one of us with our different eye color, hair texture, different shades of brown and different shaped noses and lips are created in the image of God, then racial and ethnic tensions should die away instantly, especially if we are to understand that underneath our deep-rooted, unscientific, man-made prejudices, ideologies and beliefs, we are all just the same created beings. The Sabbath, the seventh day of the weekly cycle, was first introduced in Genesis chapter 2 verses 1 to 3. 
The English word rested in verse 3 is a translation of the Hebrew word Shabbat. It was reintroduced in Exodus chapter 20 verses 8 to 11 on Mount Sinai in current Saudi Arabia in Western Asia by God to Moses that briefly retold the story of creation. And it will be preached in love to the entire world alongside the everlasting gospel that gives everlasting life in Revelation chapter 14 verses 6 and 7. And this will usher in the second coming of Jesus Christ according to Revelation chapter 14 and verse 14. Jesus said in Mark chapter 2 verses 27 and 28 that the Sabbath was specifically made not for any unique nation, neither for any specific group of churches, but specifically for man. Now he could boldly make that statement. Do you want to know why? Because he was in the world and the world was made by him and the world knew him not, as John 1 verse 10 confirms. And in Matthew chapter 28 and verse 18, after his resurrection and before his ascension, he said that all power is given unto me in both heaven and in earth. Now in Isaiah chapter 66 verses 22 and 23, we are foretold by the most quoted prophet in the New Testament that in the new heaven and in the new earth, that the Sabbath will be fully restored and kept all over again with the true worship of God with all who have accepted the ticket into eternity. So now that we have acknowledged through the Holy Scriptures that the Sabbath is a memorial of the creation story, how can we practice and observe this sacred day from sunset to sunset on this current earth, the only day in the weekly cycle that God has blessed and sanctified before we keep it in the earth made new? Can it actually be kept holy and how do we observe it? If you are a married couple, you could spend quality time together and open up the Sabbath at sunset or you may want to spend time with each other in the beauty of nature or you want to spend that time together in the luxury of your home. But it should be a time that you not only strengthen your time with each other, but it should also be a time to reminisce on that sacred union, the institution of marriage between a man and a woman that God set up at the beginning of time that is also a memorial of the creation story. But what if you have children? It is often said that a family that prays together stays together. And the narrator can talk from experience that the Sabbath is also a time when families should develop a stronger bond with each other. For as everyone is very busy during the week, this should be a time that families rebuild relationships with each other that will avoid having a dysfunctional home. But what if you do not have a family? Then it should also be a time to spend with friends. And you can either share each other's experience in the week and strengthen each other if one is feeling rather down. Or you can spend time in nature as the narrator has been doing for years and you will have a deep appreciation for what has been created by the creator. But there may be times you may want to be a loner like the narrator and spend that time alone, especially in nature. Now you should never bear no burdens on the Sabbath day, for it should be a time to not only reflect, but to also psychoanalyze, not via the Freudian way, but by the words of the psalmist that says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. So the Sabbath should not only be a time to recognize the creation of the creator and the creation story, but also a time where you rebuild your relationship with the Most High. But in order for the entire world to understand the true nature of the creation story, it has to be made known unto them what man forfeited and how it can be restored. And we have to go right back in time to the very beginning. We can only try to use our finite imagination to get a picture of what man's first home looked like. 
it had uncontaminated pure clean air with a higher concentration of oxygen in the air that allowed creatures to grow much bigger than their descendants today. And it had absolutely breathtaking beauty. It had everything that man needed. We have shown that fresh water is the most critical substance for all life on earth. And the water that flows through rivers is fresh, meaning that it contains less than 1% salt. So man's first home had four long rivers that on a modern geological map stretch throughout Africa and the Near East. And man had a number of natural resources that were his for free. And they could be used at any time by him at his leisure, unlike the modern brutal wars that are fighting over them. In Genesis chapter 2 verses 10, 11 and 12, one of the four rivers surrounded a territory called Havila, which today is the largest country in the Middle East, the kingdom of Saudi Arabia, the Gulf state that spans most of the Arabian Peninsula, that was once lush and green before it turned into a sandy desert, and it had the metal gold, the plant bedellium, and the precious stone, the onyx. What value did each one of them have? According to Virtue's English Dictionary, gold is a precious metal of a bright yellow colour and the most ductile and malleable of all metals, and one of the heaviest, so it is the most easiest metal to work with. Bedellium is an aromatic gum resin brought chiefly from Africa and India in pieces of different sizes and figures and it is used as a perfume and a medicine. And the onyx is a semi-pellucid gem with variously coloured zones of veins, an agate with layers of chalcedony, one of which is flesh coloured and it is used for cameos in carving different forms of artwork. So man had the gold, the bedellium and the onyx to freely use in his early home. And these three different materials are still widely used today. Frankincense and myrrh are perhaps best known for their biblical connotations. But this tree sap has been prized across the world for over 6,000 years. These fragrant incense pieces come from the Bursaraceae family of trees and are found across the Horn of Africa and the Arabian Peninsula. So for 6,000 years, the resin bedellium that is found in Africa and Asia and is extracted from the genus of flowering plants we today call Comifora is still used in the 21st century for both cosmetic and for medicinal purposes. And it was once central to the ancient trade route throughout Afro-Eurasia. The onyx is still used for decorative artwork and in the cultures of Central America, they made face masks from sardonyx and in ancient Rome, the Caesars were highly praised in their detailed depictions on the sardonic stone. And that very detailed style of sculpture from ancient Rome that covered a sculpted piece with the onyx stone was to be reintroduced in the 19th century with a sculpture of a black woman from the French colonies and a black man from the Sudan who were both sculpted in bronze and then completed in a cameo from the onyx stone by the French ethnographic sculptor Charles Henry Joseph Cordier. But the most widely used metallic chemical element in both the ancient and modern world is gold that is widely dispersed throughout the earth's crust. Some classified as a rare earth metal, others as a precious metal, and it is the only metal that can be bent into all different shapes. It was thoroughly used throughout the ancient world in almost every single culture, from signet rings in ancient Egypt earrings from Ur of the Chaldees and coins of the greco bactrian kings. And modern studies have shown that it has played a major role in many of the Earth's conflicts for half a millennia that is still acted out in a number of the modern minor conflicts of today, especially on the African continent. And in the very land that it was first once freely available to man, in the land of Havila in the garden, the Arabs in the year 1997 created a Saudi Arabian mining company called Maden that earns billions annually in revenue that was originally created to extract the Saudi gold from the earth. But in excavating natural resources, it also unearthed where fallen man went terribly wrong. 
for he started to make sacred the things in the animal, mineral and vegetable kingdom. As men are earnest in researching the ancient cultures of the pagan occult world to try to make sense of our current digital world, you can see how far he has greatly drifted from his true origins in the creation story. The nature gods that he manufactured in his own thoughts were very ugly and their beliefs were totally driven by fear. Man would cut into his own flesh and offer his own blood to the gods and sadly also sacrifice innocent children to appease the gods. And everything in nature became a god where man served the creature more than the creator. The very water that was divided into two portions on the second day of creation became a god in the Sumerian Babylonian pantheon called Ea or Enki with water streaming out of its body. The cow is a herbivorous mammal that was created on the sixth day of creation but in the Egyptian pantheon it was worshipped as the god Apis, the sacred bull of Memphis, the image of the soul of Osiris. Seeded grapes were created on the third day of creation as part of man's original diet. But in the Greek pantheon, it was associated with Bacchus, the god of drunken debauchery and intoxication. The planetary bodies within our solar system was created on the fourth day of creation, and some of their planetary functions is to give light upon the earth. But in Teotihuacan in Mexico in Central America, men made a highly sophisticated pyramid complex in imitation of the planetary bodies with the idea that maths governs everything, an idea that is still taught in the philosophy of psycho-history. And the serpent alongside man was also created on the sixth day of the creation week, would end up being the most worshipped thing on the earth. Not only through Eastern yoga exercises and the martial arts, but it was carved into architecture all over the world. And man preserved the multitude of his deities in temples such as the Pantheon in ancient Rome as a memorial of his foolish, degrading idolatry. But what is even more disturbing is that even the very stone that built the temples, the ancient mind with its warped pantheistic psychology believed that each one of these individual stones had some kind of magical property. And the late English philologist Sir E. A. Wallace Budge details what this belief entailed and he said that, the old astrologers believed that semi-precious stones were bearers of the influences of the seven astrological stars or planets. The astrologers believed that each stone possessed a sort of living personality which could experience sickness and disease and could become old and powerless and even die. Superstitions of this kind were common in Babylonia in the third millennium BC and the rubrics in the Book of the Dead prove that the same was the case in Egypt. So these stones that God placed in the earth became sacred to man in the ancient world and it is sadly being incorporated into the modern world. The Egyptians made jewelry from these different stones and later down in the Roman Empire, the Gnostics turned these stones into sacred gems and rings. But the planets in the solar system were not only seen as individual gods, but each one had its own sacred stone. The planet Saturn, the second largest planet in the solar system, was represented by the obsidian stone in both ancient Sumer and Babylon and also among the Aztecs. And this obsidian mirror in the British Museum belonged to the 16th century English occultist John Dee, as recent studies are confirming. And this astrologer was the man who was the spiritual advisor to the last Tudor monarch, Queen Elizabeth the I in Protestant England. One of the most precious gems, the diamond represented Earth's only satellite, the moon, and the most precious metal, gold, represented the star at the center of the solar system, the blazing sun. But the beliefs from the pagan world are receiving a rebirth, and the onyx stone that was once in the Garden of Eden is now one of the most marketed gems in the modern world with the belief that it has certain powers that can ward off negative energy. And today's generation who are following the idolatrous superstitions of Egypt and Babylon wear the onyx bracelets with the belief that it can remove evil from your life. And on occult and witchcraft websites, 
you can see they bless these stones with incense before they use it. So the bdellium and the onyx from the Garden of Eden are now being used for occult practices. The whole of the plant kingdom was also once worshipped as a life force in the ancient world and it is being revived over again in the modern digital world and there was one plant that was revered throughout the world and two western commentators detailed the beliefs of the ancients. The worship of trees as proxies of divinity was prevalent throughout the ancient world says the late Canadian esoteric writer Manly Palmer Hall. Of all symbolic flowers, the lotus blossom of India and Egypt and the rose of the Rosicrucians are the most important. In their symbolism, these two flowers are considered as identical. The rose and the lotus are yonic emblems representing the woman's productive organ, signifying primarily the maternal creative mystery, while the eastern lily is considered to be phallic, representing the male's productive organs. The Brahmin and Egyptian initiates employed the blossom to represent the spinning vortices of spiritual energy, located at various points along the spinal column and called chakras, or whirling wheels by the Hindus. And the lotus-headed scepter symbolic of self-fulfillment and divine prerogative was a universal motive in Egyptian art. On the late Assyrian monuments, Sir Austin Hemilayard said, the lotus frequently takes the place of the honeysuckle, both as a sacred emblem carried by the winged figures and as an ornament in architecture and in embroideries. I have attributed this change to a close connection with Egypt, says these two authorities. The water lily or lotus plant is an aquatic herb that is found all over the world and in the ancient world it was associated with rebirth because of the way in which it emerged from the water followed the movement of the sun and closed back up and returned into the water and repeated the same process the next day and it was associated with the sun god Ra in Egypt. In the British Museum there is a painting that shows the lotus in the bottom left and in between two women in the top right for it represented one of the gods. In the Phoenician section there are two men holding a lotus plant in their hand. In the Medo-Persian section, lotuses are carved into their architecture and many of the monarchs pose with a lotus in their hand like King Darius. That seems to be a common practice in the Orient among Western Asian kings. In the Assyrian section in the British Museum, what many have mistaken for a modern watch is actually the lotus plant that was worn on the wrists of both the high dignitaries in the Neo-Assyrian kingdom, particularly the kings, and also among their winged deities. And in the Japanese section, the red-faced Buddhist wisdom king deity, Ragaraja, who looks frighteningly freaky, also sits upon the lotus flower. You see, in 1400 BC Hindu Vedic texts, as well as among Buddhism, Sikhism and Jainism, the lotus is revered among their deities, and it is still preserved among the most influential practice from the East that has come into the West. It is yoga, the serpent power within exercise that is very popular among women. And in this perfume ad called Alien Goddess Mugla, you can see that the central theme of this commercial is not just the woman, but specifically the plant that the pagan mind thought symbolized rebirth, which is the lotus. And what God gave to man for free to look after has now become deified. But that is not the only thing that he reverses. With his bling bling and accumulation of material wealth, man foolishly thinks that he is a God, a divine being, even misusing the Bible to justify his arrogance of self-praise. And he foolishly believes that his good looks, his academic credentials and his privilege makes him superior than others. And recent evidence has shown that all over the planet, heads of states are living extremely lavish lifestyles while their subjects are struggling to make ends meet, some even living in dire poverty. One man knew the roots of this custom. In a book titled Crystallizing Public Opinion, written by one of the least known but one of the most influential figures of the 20th century, 
Sigmund Freud's nephew, Edward Bernays. He traces the history of self-praise through the marketing of art that can be traced right back to the earliest of civilizations. His clients who he advised was the US government to coerce people to join the war effort in World War I, the CIA to bring down the Guatemalan government Procter & Gamble, the General Motors Corporation, General Electric, NBC, CBS, Time, the American Dental Association, many of the US presidents in the White House, the Hotel, the Waldorf Astoria and the NAACP. And if you want to know why bacon and eggs is the staple diet for US citizens, and why since the 1920s to this very day women all over the world smoke as a status symbol, and why you are influenced in buying things that you do not need through the power of advertising, it can all be traced to the father of propaganda. Edward Bernays. In his investigations on the history of propaganda and its psychological influence on the masses, he said that in ancient Sumeria, Babylonia, Syria and Persia in the dawn of civilization, even the despotic rulers were aware of their publics. Proclaiming the divinity of kings was a step of importance in gaining the worshipful obedience of subjects. Rulers impressed themselves upon the people through erecting statues and other monuments. In Greece, state coinage, the literature of the classical Greeks of Homer, Hesiod and others praised their leaders and the glory of Greek history stimulated the loyalty of the people to their leaders. Man developed art in order to convince their civilian population that their heads of state were gods as a strategy to keep their people in check. What a clever way to control people. They held on to the deceptive false philosophical lie at Eden that he is a god and it has passed down even to modern times where mortal men just loves the praise that is only meant to belong solely unto God. And many of these men have sadly murdered many innocent people who do not share their vision. But today man is taking it one step further by slowly destroying human relationships with the creation of artificial intelligence of his alter ego. Very, very spooky. And as films always forewarns us of what the powers that shouldn't be planned for the rest of mankind for the future, man in rejecting God thinks that he has the right to take his place via gene editing, that is fitting around with DNA fragments, an attempt to make designer humans in the lab that has been titled CRISPR. And these women have been appointed to be a part of the Pontifical Academy of Sciences by the last absolute power on the earth, the papacy. No matter how far man has drifted away from God, whether he be a Nubian under the Tropic of Cancer, an Asian from the Orient in the East, or Caucasians from the Northern Hemisphere, in the 21st century, God is still calling his human family, the sons of Adam by creation, to become sons of God by conversion. And whether you are a dreadlocked man with tattoos, a veterinarian who spends time in a lab with God's creation, or a woman manager who is running a successful busy cocktail bar restaurant business, or you have a shady criminal past, or you are a politician not fully aware of the globalist agenda, or one who picks rice in the paddy fields of Indonesia for the global market, or you're working in the corporate business, financial and banking sector. God is inviting you all to be with him for eternity to be a part of the new recreation story in the new heaven and in the new earth. Now most of the inhabitants of the earth are going to reject the invitation to eternity. Most will either laugh, scoff or ridicule it. The Holy Scriptures forewarns us, but they still have to be told so they at least have had an opportunity to hear it. Now you're going to interact with some individuals who will want to aggressively enforce their very deep-rooted, narrow-minded brand of godliness upon you. But make sure that everything you hear is in line with the word of God only. For if you do accept by faith the true God of heaven into your hearts, if you follow the divine blueprint properly, the narrator will promise and guarantee you and he talks from personal experience 
that if you allow no human being to get in between your relationship with the Most High God, it will bring a very deep inner peace and happiness. The creation story is absolutely essential for all of us to know so that people are aware of the origin of this earth through creation, the fall and the paradise that will be restored and why the earth is in the condition that it is in today. And yes, we know that many will still have many pressing questions. But the little that we do know, let us hold on to it and I promise that once your faith develops, your knowledge will grow also. Through a lot of research, you know, I have managed to find a platform to put the racism and the reconciliation part to the full version on. I will keep you updated when it's fully uploaded, but in the meantime, continue to research until we go to part two of this study.